John chapter 6, verses 41 through 59. And if you will, please stand with the Bible in your hand as we read together. This is the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 41 through 59. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread of life which came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews, therefore, quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. This is the word of God, amen? Amen. Let's take just a few moments in silent prayer and just ask the Lord that he would bless our hearts with this message this morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you this morning for this glorious text, just power packed with so much truth. God, I pray that you would, as you did then, illumine our minds, illumine our understanding by your spirit. God, teach us the truths that are contained here. We acknowledge our great need of you this morning to understand these things. And Lord, I pray that as you teach us, as by your spirit you open our understanding. God, I pray that we would live more fervently for you, more faithfully for you. God, you are worthy of our worship, worthy of our very lives. So we worship you, Lord, this morning and thank you for this. If there's anyone here that isn't saved, that God, that is still just spiritually dead in their trespasses and sins, I pray, Lord, that for your great namesake, for your glory, I pray that you would open their understanding, Lord, to reveal their sin to them, to reveal the the treasure that is Christ and save them, Lord, for your everlasting praise and worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you may be seated. And the title of our sermon this morning is The Grumbling Dead and the Living Bread. The Grumbling Dead and the Living Bread. A contrast of sorts from John chapter 6, especially in this passage uh, from verses 41 through 59. And As we've been working through the Gospel of John, we've seen this bread of life discourse progress uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ. This all began, if you remember, as the Lord was on the Sea of Galilee and he fed the 5,000. As the Lord performed that great miracle, there were many in that day that followed him, simply interested in the miracle, you know, interested in lunch. They got dinner and a show, so to speak. And so they followed the Lord Jesus Christ around the sea. Today, in verses 41 to 59, we find them in Capernaum in the synagogue as the Lord Jesus Christ is preaching what is often called the bread of life sermon or the bread of life discourse. 
As we get into this text, there are so many profound truths that are here, just laden down with theology. We're going to see theology explained. We're going to get some application. Uh, there's going to be some conviction, as the Lord intends from his word. There's just so much to learn here. Um, but as Jesus Christ is teaching in Capernaum, and as we go through it, I hope these truths are becoming more and more clear to you as we work through them. In Capernaum, in the synagogue that day, Although the truths may have been becoming more and more clear to the Jews that were listening to him, they were becoming more and more hostile toward what he was teaching. The opposition is ramping up, and we're going to see it ramp up from now all the way to the cross. That's just the way that it was at that time, and we see it beginning in verse 41. Much of the teaching that's here, much of what we're going to learn as we work through this passage, really is set in context in the first few verses. So we're going to get through verses 41 through maybe around verses 47 or 48. We'll finish up the discourse next week uh, and you'll be able to see where we're going from our text this morning. The first point on your notes that I want you to see that we have to establish is that the grumbling dead reject the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what do we mean in the beginning here by the grumbling dead? I want to set that up for you. We know that those who are alive in Christ are spiritually alive. That we saw from John chapter 3, for instance, in the Lord's conversation with Nicodemus, that for one to be alive in Christ, they have to be born again. The Lord has to give them a new heart, open their understanding, fill them with his spirit, um, and they become a new creation in Christ, born again. They become alive in Christ. Ephesians says that we were all outside of Christ. We are all dead in our trespasses and sins. As a spiritually dead person, we have no understanding. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says that the things of God cannot be discerned by the natural man because they are spiritually discerned. They are things of God. So in order for a dead, spiritually dead person, to understand the things of God, they have to be born again. They have to have their understanding opened, their eyes and ears and hearts opened by God. It's, remember the story of Lydia in Acts, where it says that the Lord opened her heart, right, to understand or to heed the things spoken by Paul. In the same way, grumbling dead sinners outside of the Lord Jesus Christ must be brought alive in Christ, uh, made alive in him to understand spiritual things. Here in Capernaum, in the synagogue on this day, you have the Jews. Now the Jews was a term that John often uses in the gospel as a name, so to speak, for those who are in opposition against the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have the Jews in the synagogue. These Jews are spiritually dead. And as we'll see in verse 41, they're not just spiritually dead, they are grumbling dead. And don't you often find that's the case with those outside of Christ? We grumble and we complain and we sin against God. It's only when we have our heart changed that we begin to live for him. So let's begin with point one, the grumbling dead reject his authority. And let's explain that and unpack that from these first few verses. Verse 41 says, the Jews, it's that those in opposition again against the Lord, the Jews then complained about him. Because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Verse 42, they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to him, do not, and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 41 then begins with the Jews complaining about Christ. Now that word in the Greek for complaining there is the word gongudzo. It almost sounds like what it means, right? Gongudzo, gongudzo. They're, they're muttering under their breath, complaining about Christ. Jesus in verse 43 calls it murmuring. It's the same word in both places. It means the same thing. It means grumbling or making complaints under your breath. Now if you've ever done, how many have done that before? Am I the only one? Okay, so we're on the same boat together. We've complained, right? If you do that, it's making complaints or making utterances under your breath. When you do that, you're, you're saying it just loud enough, just soft enough. No one can really understand what you're saying, but everybody around you knows exactly what you're doing. They know exactly what's on your mind. And you're wearing your emotions on your sleeve when you do it. They know here exactly what the crowd is intending by their grumbling. Sadly enough, this isn't the first time that the Jews have been caught grumbling, is it? 
If you've read your Bible, spent any time in the Bible, you know that grumbling, if you will, is like a, a character trait for the Jews. Like white men can't dance and Jews grumble about Jesus. It's just a, you know, a character uh, a characteristic of these Jews here. They grumble and complain. And if you've read your Bible, you know this begins in the Old Testament. It's a similar circumstance. The word murmuring here, or the word grumbling, actually calls our remembrance back to those Old Testament examples. In the same way that we started in John chapter 6 and we saw the, the two exoduses, if you will, how we saw and made comparisons between the Old Testament exodus and now with Christ coming, a New Testament, a second exodus, if you will, this also calls our attention back to the Old Testament, to that first exodus. And I want you to hear a couple of these passages because this is going to set up for us what God feels or thinks about grumbling and complaining. So I want you to remember some of these instances. The first is Exodus 16. You don't have to turn there, but listen uh, to the words of that passage beginning in verse two. It says, the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Now, when the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, they were the leaders at the time. When they grumbled against Moses and Aaron, God determined that that was them grumbling ultimately against him, ultimately against his authority, his right to rule and reign over them. The grumbling was a direct rebellion against God. And we'll explain that in just a moment. Listen to Exodus chapter 17, beginning in verse two. It says there that the people thirsted there for water and the people grumbled, Gangudzo, right? Grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Now put the grumbling, put the complaining in context. The people were in Egypt dying. <laughs> they had had their quota for block, their quota for brick increased. They'd had the straw taken away. It says that they were burned with harsh labor. And when the Bible says harsh, it's an understatement. It was harsh. Labor was harsh. God, with his mighty arm, brings them out from slavery in Egypt to call them to himself as his own prized possession, his own special people, brings them out of Egypt with great wealth. They plundered the Egyptians on the way out of Egypt, brings them into the wilderness intending to give them his law, make them his people, and then put them into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And what do the, Egypt, what do the Israelites do? They grumble, they gongudzo, they mumble and complain against God under their breath in the wilderness saying, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? After all that, they didn't trust the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter one, verse 27. The Lord says here, God says, you complained in your tents and said, because the Lord hates us. Really? I mean, God hates them? It's just absurd, right? When you're in sin, you're insane. <laughs> you just don't get it. Because the Lord hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Craziness, right? So, have you ever com complained before? I'm not the only one. Have you ever complained before? Yeah. Amen. Well, confess it before the Lord. We've complained, right? What exactly is complaining? If you break it down and you think about what complaining is, Think about it for a moment. Complaining is expressing dissatisfaction, right? It's explaining or expressing annoyance. It's expressing resentment. It's expressing anger, expressing bitterness. Complaining demonstrates that you are ungrateful. You are unthankful, that you're spiteful. If you think about it, what the Bible says that complaining or grumbling, being a sin itself, also leads to other sin. Psalm 106 verse 24 says of the Israelites, they despised the pleasant land. It calls it pleasant. It's a pleasant land. They despised that pleasant land. They did not believe his word, but complained in their tents and did not obey the voice of the Lord. So being ungrateful, being unthankful, being a complainer, a grumbler will also lead you into further disobedience, further sin. But you can also see that complaining, can't you, is a fruit of unbelief. 
a fruit of a lack of faith in the Lord, a lack of faith in God. And that's why God is so serious about complaining. It's the fruit of unbelief. So serious about grumbling. And listen, as with the Jews, complaining is ultimately dissatisfaction, annoyance, resentment, thanklessness, and sin against God himself, against God himself. It's a rejection of his right to rule over you. It's a rejection of his sovereignty, a rejection of his providence, a rejection of God himself. God himself in the Bible calls it rebellion, calls it rebellion. When you grumble and complain, God calls it rebellion. And listen to God's response. We saw the grumbling and complaining of the people in Exodus. Listen to God's response now to their complaining. The first passage, Numbers 11, verse 1, it says there that the people complained in the hearing of the Lord. Now remember, they're complaining against Aaron and Moses, so to speak, but that just a one level, ultimately their complaint is against God himself. It says they complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. Their misfortunes that we've got no water to drink. We've got no food to eat. I want meat. Tired of these little pastry things. <laughs> they're complaining and grumbling, but what about us? What are our misfortunes, right? What are our misfortunes today? You know what? God, I've had it with this job. I can't take it anymore. Where are you, Lord, when I need you? Give me a new job. God, I've, I've had it with this marriage. This woman you gave me, right? Like Adam in the Garden of Eden, complaining against the Lord about your marriage. These lousy kids, they don't listen, right? Running up and down all the day long, you know, driving me crazy, complaining. This TV, Lord, the reception on this TV is so bad. I need a new TV. Wife complaining against her. I'm tired of the lousy attitude of my husband. He just complains all the time. It's just complaining, complaining. Think about your misfortunes. But listen, now when they complain about their misfortunes, listen to what the Lord says. When the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. The Lord's anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Wow. God's pretty serious about complaining. Numbers 14, verse 26. Listen to this. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complains against me? You think about God. You know, today we were witnessing yesterday. I was witnessing to a, a man, myself and another brother were out, and um, myself and Noel. And uh, we, we talked to this one man for a period of time, and he was uh, saying that God is forgiving. That's what God does. God is forgiving. God is loving. It never once entered his mind that God is also just and that God is also a judging God, and God is also a God of wrath and a God of judgment. Can you think, you know, imagine yourself standing before God with all your sin, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, and God saying of you, how long have I bared, have I borne and endured your sin for all this time, right? It's, it's, it's staggering to think of God thinking of that, you know, thinking of us in that way. Here he is thinking of the people of Israel that way. How long must I bear with this complaining generation, this complaining evil congregation who complains against me? He goes on, I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Notice it's against him, right? Verse 28, say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. Now remember, they said, God, why have you brought us out here into the wilderness to kill us and our children and our livestock? So what God says in response, I'll do to you just as you have spoken of me. I'm gonna kill you and your children and your livestock out here in the wilderness. He says, the carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness, all of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above. We know from that story that all of those 20 years old and above were all killed in the wilderness except for who? Joshua and Caleb because of their faithfulness, right? They trusted the Lord. But you think about it now, God killed them for their complaining. God killed them for their complaining. Now you may say to yourself, right? You know, that's the Old Testament. You know, back then God was angry. He was an angry God. He wasn't the grandfatherly forgiving God that we know from the New Testament. Or you may say to yourself, you know, that's what the Bible says, but that's not right. Listen, you better stop your complaining. You're gonna end up right in the same place they did. These died in the wilderness. When you complain, you think about it, God is always right. God is always good, always right. 
And so when you complain against God, you're challenging God's wisdom, you're challenging his love, you're challenging his grace, you're challenging his mercy, you're challenging his justice, you're challenging his righteousness, you're challenging his love, you're challenging his plans, you're challenging his providence, you're challenging his sovereignty, you're challenging God. Grumbling there, can you see it, right? Can you see grumbling represents rebellion against God? Make sense? just as serious about grumbling and complaining in the New Testament as he was in the Old. I want to give you an example of that. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to tie these things together. We have a New Testament example of this. We're going to tie it all together with what we just talked about in the Old Testament. Paul does that for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I want you to look there, beginning in verse 1. Lest you think somehow that your grumbling and complaining just has no impact today, or maybe it's not sin, or maybe just God turns a blind eye to it. You know, he just winks at your grumbling and complaining. Listen to verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. In other words, they went through the Red Sea together. These are Paul's kinsmen, his, the Israelites, as they were in the wilderness, going into the, the wilderness. They passed through the Red Sea together. They were under the cloud, right, by day, the fire by night, as God led them through the wilderness. It says in verse 2, all were baptized into Moses, just meaning that they were in union with one another, in union with Moses, as Moses was the selected leader for the people by God. And they were in union with Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Verse 3, all of them ate the same spiritual food, the manna that God gave, right? All drank the same spiritual drink. God gave them water out of a rock. For they drank, it says, of that spiritual rock. You'll notice there is a capital R. Because it says that followed them, that rock was Christ. There's a legend among um, Jewish rabbis that the rock that Moses struck to bring water out was Jesus Christ. And literally that rock hopped through after them in the wilderness and followed them around. That rock was Christ. That's an old uh, Jewish legend. Um, verse five, but with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. That entire first generation, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, were killed in the wilderness. Verse six, here's the meaning of all this. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. If you think about complaining, complaining generally is, is because uh, you don't think you're being treated as you should, or you're not getting what you think you should get. Things aren't going the way that you think they should go. And it's a form of lust. It's a form of covetousness. What this is saying is that we don't need to lust the way that they lusted. We need to take their example and avoid that, or the same thing is going to happen to you and I, Okay. Here, this lust in verse 6, specifically referencing physical lust. In other words, the people at this time, the Corinthians, didn't have their bodies under control. They had lustful appetites that they were indulging, and we're to take our bodies under control. We're to buffet our body. We're not to allow some indulged sinful lust to have control over us. The Israelites in the wilderness, now if you think about it in terms of what Paul is saying right here, had become disqualified from entering the promised land um, because of their lust, their self-indulgence, their covetousness, their greed. Ultimately, that's expressed here in 1 Corinthians as four major sins. And I want you to see these. They're disqualified because of four major sins. The first sin we find in verse 7. Look at verse 7. Where Paul says, do not become idolaters. So idolatry is the first one. Do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's specifically speaking of the golden calf incident at Mount Sinai. If you remember that incident, right? Moses is up on the mountain. The people are down in the valley. They tell Aaron, Aaron make gods for us. Aaron takes the gold, throws it into the fire and look, out pops this calf, right? It's like Aaron said. There was a, basically an orgy that takes place. They sinned in the valley that day, uh, consuming all of that idolatry on their lusts, eating, drinking, and playing, 
refers to here specifically ritualistic or sacrificial eating and drinking to gods in religious worship. Playing is a word there that, without going into too much detail, means sexual immorality. And so again, this eating, drinking, rising up to play, all speaking of the immorality of the Israelites in that, uh, at that particular time with the golden calf. How many people died that day? Do you remember what the Bible says? About 3,000. About 3,000 died that day. God's serious about this particular sin of idolatry on lust and a greed that goes hand in hand with complaining, right? They complained. Moses was taken up. He's taken too long on the mountain. You know, come make gods for us. We want our own gods. The second sin we find in verse eight. Verse eight says, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Now here, if you remember from uh, Numbers 25, this is referring to the Israelites being sexually immoral with the Moabite women. They were sexually immoral. They went after foreign wives, which God told them not to do. Uh, they entered into sexual immorality with them, and eventually the Moabite women led them away from God, led them into idolatry, all right? The third sin, verse 9, nor let us tempt Christ. This tempting of Christ is the third major sin. It says, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Now, if you remember, this is referring to Numbers 21. God had provided for them manna to eat out of heaven. Uh, this was a heavenly food. It, it had to have tasted awesome, right? Food right out of heaven. It doesn't get any better than that. He provided them food out of heaven and he provided them water to drink. But what did the Israelites do? They complained and they, they ganguzo under their breath against God. And when they did that, complaining over and over and over against God for his provision to them, think about it, they try God's patience try his patience, try his patience, try his patience, and they question his goodness to them. They question his provision. And God told Moses, get away from them. Let me consume them, right? In a moment. Don't tempt the Lord. The fourth sin we find in verse 10, and here it is, number four, nor complain, as some of them also complained. And you can see elements of complaining in all of these, can't you? It, it's one of those sins that is pervasive. You see complaining in all of this. It says in verse 10, nor complain, and some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. This particular incident that is referred to here in verse 10 was the incident with Korah and Korah's rebellion in Numbers 16. If you remember that from reading the Old Testament, Korah and others with him, the traitors that were with him, were destroyed by God. Ground opened up, swallowed them alive. They went down into the pit. The Jews, that was those who were against Moses and Aaron, ultimately then against God. God did all of that in the eyes of them that sat there and watched. They saw the whole thing. And those Jews saw that incident. And then immediately after that incident was over, they complained against Moses and Aaron and complained ultimately against God because some, some of the Lord's people died. It's like, wow, man, how thick-headed and hard-hearted do you have to be by this point to after God basically kills Korah and those with him for his rebellion, they rebel even more by complaining against the Lord killing Korah and those men. They complained again. And what happened? There, were, uh, uh, there was a plague that swept through the people and 14,700 people died as a result of the plague. God's pretty serious about complaining, isn't he? And this is in the New Testament. And this, the Bible says, Paul says, is an admonition to us, is an example to us that we're to heed, that we're to follow. It says, verse 11, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the end of the ages have come. So we can't become overconfident or prideful in this. We need to be humble about our complaining. We need to work on our complaining. Uh, verse 12 says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And in the grace of God, the mercy of God, verse 13 says, no temptations overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful and he'll not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape. Make a way of escape. What's a, what, what, what's a way of escape from complaining, from grumbling? 
what's the antidote, if you will, to complaining, to grumbling, to murmuring, to ganguzo, you know, under your breath? What's that? Thankfulness. Yeah, contentment, joy in the Lord. How, how do you battle? Hey, I don't know about you. I mean, I've had phases before where it's like you walk out the, do- the, the door in the morning, ah, oh, it's so hot. You're complaining, you're, within seconds you're complaining. You get in the car and the AC's not, oh, this AC. You pull out on the road, oh, this traffic. All right? We're so prone to it. So prone to it. But what's the, what's the antidote for that? Lord, thank you for this sun. <laughs> you know, what an awesome weather, you know, we've got. And Lord, thank you for this traffic. This hour commute's going to give me time to listen to a sermon. Some preachers, this 23-minute commute is going to give me a time to listen to this 18-minute sermon. I hope you don't listen to those. <laughs> but, you know, we have a reason to, to take joy in the Lord, right? It's, it's the antidote, the, the way of escape that God provides for complaining is contentment, is joy, is thankfulness. We were at a fellowship the other night, and one of the brothers uh, asked the question, um, you know, why is it, do you think, that, that after a period of time, you come to a church, you know, like this, and it's like, this is great. You know, I love the, the teaching. I love the people. Look how hospitable everyone is. It's just a loving, this is the best church I've ever been a part of. You know, and then like a year and a half later, uh, they're skipping every now and then, maybe skipping a lot, and then pretty soon you don't see them anymore. So why do people take it for granted after a period of time? It's a lack of gratefulness. We have much to be thankful for, don't we? And when you lack gratefulness, when you lack contentment, when you lack joy, the thing that comes driving in in its place is ganguzo, you know, murmuring and grumbling and complaining against God. And we are so prone to that. Um, Paul says in Philippians 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 11, he says that he has learned in whatever circumstances he is in to be what? Could be content, to be content. You know, it's interesting there in, in chapter 4, verse 11, that he says, you know what? In every circumstance that I am in, I am content. Is that what he says? No, it says he has to what? Has to learn it. Doesn't come, not, you know, one day uh, you're walking along a road and oh, you're saved, you know, you get the halo over your head and now you're just content in every circumstance. Is that how it works? No. But Paul had to learn contentment. We have to learn contentment too. We learn contentment by getting through difficult circumstances, being put in circumstances where we, you know, it's hard. Uh, and we have to watch ourselves. We have to monitor ourselves because we're so prone to it, Right? Um, be content, be joyful in the Lord. Can you see from all of that though how complaining is a resentment of God's sovereignty? How it's a rejection of his authority? These dead grumblers, back in John chapter six, these dead grumblers are rejecting the Lord's authority over their lives, rejecting what the Lord is saying. There's some reasons for that and we'll talk about those in a moment. Don't grumble and complain. Love the Lord, trust him, right? Be content. Verse 41, back in John chapter six. Told you we're gonna have to set the stage a little bit here. We're working through that. Verse 41, here they are, they're complaining against him once again. Again, it's like a character trait for them. Um, The Jews, those who are in opposition, are complaining against him. And more specifically, they're complaining about a specific statement that he's made. And that statement is this, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Specifically in the Greek, it's out of, out of heaven. All right, That's the same thing, now follow with me here, that's the same thing that he said in verse 33. In verse 33, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven, gives life to the world. It's the same thing that he said in verse 35. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, he who believes in me shall never thirst. Verse 38, for I have come down from heaven, there it is again, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And here in verse 41, I'm the bread of life, or the bread which came down from heaven. That's pretty clear to us. As we've been working through the text, those statements of the Lord becoming clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer, right? We understand. If you read those, we understand that uh, if you believe in him, you put your faith and trust in him, that you can have everlasting life. We know that come to Christ, we looked at that, right? Come to Christ means turning from your sin, means repenting and putting your faith in Christ. We know that that leads to eternal life, that he says you can have eternal life. If you'll repent, put your faith in him. But for them, because they're already in a complaining mindset, right? They're already grumbling. They're already muttering under their breath. They're already angry, already hostile. They're in sin, so they're insane. They don't get what's going on. They're already angry. And so rather than these statements of the Lord Jesus Christ becoming clearer and clearer and clearer to them, 
It's just generating more and more and more anger. More and more and more hostility. And their anger shows up here as grumbling and murmuring and complaining against the Lord. Now, one of the reasons, and the obvious reason, that these who are grumbling dead in Capernaum in the synagogue that day don't get what the Lord is teaching is because the Bible says that they're spiritually discerned. Natural man cannot accept or receive the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. Uh, you have to have your eyes opened, uh, spiritual eyes opened to discern those things. They're spiritually dead in their trespasses and sins and the things of God to them are foolishness. It's just foolishness. We see that in their response to the Lord here in this passage. But in, there's another reason, and I want to make this connection for you in the passage. There's another reason why they are rejecting the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, why they don't want to have anything to do with it. And ultimately, it's because there's a stumbling block here. And there's a stumbling block. There's a stumbling block here for the Jews that last, has lasted now for the last 2,000 years and will until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. There's a stumbling block for many that you'll talk to. And that's the, the humiliation that is associated with the incarnation of Christ. There's a humiliation here. The, the humiliation that the Lord Jesus Christ endured to come to earth, take on the form of a man to save sinners. It's called the humiliation of Christ. We read about that. You can hear it in the condescending way that they respond in verse 42. With all the complaining and grumbling in their hearts, listen to what they said. They said, is this not Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I've come down from heaven? You hear it? It's just bubbling over with like disgust and condescending. In other words, are you kidding me? Gangugo, ganguzo, ganguzo. Can you believe this guy, this ridiculous claim? We know him. Matter of fact, his parents live right over there. Who does he think he is? That's basically what they're saying. And it's in response, they had in their minds that the Lord Jesus Christ would come as the conquering king, fulfilling all of their desires, exactly what they were looking for. And yet he came in his first advent as a, a suffering servant, came as the suffering servant who would be dis despised and rejected of men, right? Isn't that what Isaiah says? He would be afflicted. This is an astounding claim, but this would have been shocking to the people, shocking to the people. Jesus says, I have come down from heaven. Standing before the people, making that statement, he's basically saying, listen, my existence didn't begin in Bethlehem. Didn't begin with those parents. My existence predates Bethlehem. Predates every, anything that you think of. Verse 62, if you look at verse 62, it's where he was before his heaven he came down from heaven where he was before. His birth narrative, his birth account, if you will, we read in John chapter one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. His birth account in verse 14, and the word became flesh. The eternal, pre-existent, self-existent word of God in verse 14 became flesh and dwelt among us. Philippians 2, here's the offense. Here's the difficulty for those who believed he would come as a conquering king. Philippians 2, he made himself of no reputation. He took the form of a slave and became obedient, even to the point of death on the cross. Isaiah said he had no form, no comeliness, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted by grief. He's just not what they're looking for, not what they're looking for, and they can't handle that. And so out of hand, who does this guy think he is? This is nothing that we've imagined. Uh, these claims that are making, he, he's making are ridiculous. It's just they're re gonna reject him out of hand. I have come down from heaven, Jesus says, they become upset. Does this rejection catch, catch the Lord off guard? Is he surprised by all of this? You know, that these guys really aren't following him. You know, he, most of these people are going to turn away. No. No, most people throughout the centuries, most, the vast majority, have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that to be true from the Bible. And the Lord soberly gives an explanation for that. I want us to see it quickly in verse 43. He gives an explanation beginning in verse 43. One of the most profound and yet controversial verses in all of the Bible 
Verse 43 says, Jesus therefore answered their complaining. And he said to them, this is an imperative, it's a command. Do not murmur among yourselves. Don't do it. And he gives an explanation for that even in verse 44. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I'll raise him up at the last day. Their condescending rejection in verse 42 leads Jesus to the command at verse 43, don't murmur. Verse 43 is a warning. You know, your complaining is gonna keep you from the truth. You're murmuring, you're complaining, you're grumbling. As long as you continue in that prideful re reliance on your own reasoning, your own wisdom, your own thoughts, you're gonna miss out on heaven. You're gonna miss the truth of what is being said. You can't believe when you're in that mindset, you have that heart. In fact, you're powerless to believe with that kind of heart. You need a new heart. In fact, Jesus says, no one, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now that word for comes to me, we saw that in verse 35, is repentance. We went through that. Turning from your life of sin, forsaking your sin, following Christ in faith. In other words, being converted, being saved, right? Unless the Father who sent me draws him, no one, in other words, no one can be converted, no one can be saved, no one can turn to Christ unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now that is a controversial statement. The words there, no one can come to me, listen, these words are intended by the Lord to take away any notion, any idea that being saved or coming to Jesus is a matter about which we can freely, in and of ourselves, decide or choose. The words, the very words themselves, are intended to take away any notion that it's up to us, that we can do anything about it. In fact, we are powerless to do anything about it in and of ourselves. Jesus says of his followers in John 15, verse 16, you did not choose me, but what? I chose you. Now, I want you to think about this. The grumbling dead must be brought to life by the drawing of the Father. Otherwise, they would never come to Christ. Now, that is a biblical truth. You can take it to the bank. The Bible says it, it's authoritative. That's what the Bible teaches. And the Bible clearly and repetitively teaches that. Now, I want to clarify for you real quick here exactly what this is saying. Now, someone might say, well, that's just your interpretation, right? I've heard people say that before. No, this needs to be your interpretation as well because this is what the Bible teaches. Follow me here. I want you to put on your thinking caps for a moment. There are only two possibilities for interpreting this verse. There are only two possibilities, all right? I wanna give those to you. Two options only for interpreting this portion of verse 44. One is this. No one can come to Christ without the Father drawing him or her. It's exactly what the verse says, okay? No one can come to Christ without, the, without God the Father drawing him or her. So God then draws everyone God then draws everyone, and the only ones that come are those that accept him as their savior, pray to receive him, ask him into their heart, or put their faith in him, however you wanna say that, okay? So God draws everyone, and the only ones that come are those that accept him, or pray to receive him, okay? You get that? God's drawing doesn't cause people to come, it only makes the coming possible, it makes it possible for people to come. And then people take the initiative, they come. They pray, they receive Christ, ask Jesus into their heart, whatever they do, okay? This is hand in hand with what um, theologians call prevenient grace. Prevenient grace. I believe it's unbiblical. We'll talk about that in a moment. The second, the second option, the only two options available, here's the second one. No one can come to Christ without God the Father drawing him or her. That's what the verse says. Very clear, right? And everyone that God draws will come because God's drawing of them causes the coming. You following me? You gotta think now. Uh, think, write some notes if you need to. Keep it clear in your head. God, in this option, only calls some, only draws some, and all of those that he draws come because God's drawing of them is the cause of their coming. Do you get it? This is hand in hand with the teaching of what scholars have called irresistible grace or efficacious grace, miracle working, wonder working, powerful grace, right? All right, those are the only two options. Now, it's important to note one, 
The word for draw in the Greek implies that there's a resistance. You know, someone might say, now, I don't believe in irresistible grace because people resist all the time. It's a foolish argument. Every one of us who were saved by God resisted up until the point that God saved us, right? It, the, the word in the Greek for draw implies that it's the drawing of something that is resisting, right? There's a resistance there. And that word means I'm drawing, I'm pulling something that is resisting, all right? Now think about this. Consider each of those two options. And I want you to remember as we went through John chapter 6, verse 37. Look at verse 37. We've got our two options. Now look at what verse 37. We're going to stay right here just in the context of John chapter 6. And we're going to prove our point, okay? John chapter 6, verse 37. All that the Father gives me, what? Will come to me, right? All that the Father gives me will come to me. The Father giving to Jesus, verse 37, and the Father drawing to Jesus, verse 44, are one and the same thing. They're not talking about different experiences. It's the same thing. The father gives in verse 37, the father draws uh, both going to Jesus in verse 37, verse 44. So it's not that he gives in verse 37, all. He doesn't give all or else all would certainly come. That doesn't happen. There are people who go to hell, right? The Bible, listen, there are no contradictions. There are no errors in the Bible. Everything in the Bible just gloriously harmonizes together so beautifully. These two passages also harmonize together. The Father gives some, and all of those that he gives will come to Christ. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. There is no such thing in Scripture as the Father giving someone who then doesn't come. It doesn't happen that way. All that the Father gives will come. And you could say all that the Father draws to Christ will come to Christ. It's the same situation. Consider for me uh, John chapter 6. Look at John chapter 6, verse 63. Verse 63. Verse 37, all that he gives, all that he draws will come. This is God's unconditional election combined with God's efficacious, infallible, irresistible grace. In John chapter 6, verse 63, listen to this. But there are some of you who don't believe. Now he's talking about his disciples, uh, others that follow. There are some of you who do not believe. He's got disciples that believe and we know out of the 12, there's one who's a devil that doesn't believe, right? For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. Now, he's going to explain that. He's going to explain the fact that there are unbelievers in the world, one of which is Judas. He's going to give an explanation for that. That explanation comes in verse 65. And he said, therefore, the explanation for that is, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. You see that? Verse 65 is the same statement as verse 44. The same concept as verse 37. Note the use of the word granted in verse 65 and the word gives in verse 37. Same concept, same exact thing. He says this again, explaining the truth of verse 64, that there are unbelievers like Judas in the world. You know, it would be no explanation whatsoever if God says, you know what, there are unbelievers in the world and God draws all and some come. It makes no sense. It's not an answering of the objection. It's not an answering of the problem. It would make no sense to say that. In other words, Jesus is explaining why some do not come to him. And the explanation for why some people like a Judas, like unbelievers in the world, don't come to Christ is because God the Father does not draw them. Because all that God draws will come to Christ. All that the Father gives the Son will come to Christ. All that have been granted will come to Christ. Acts 13, 48 says, all who have been appointed to eternal life, what? Believed. Because it has been appointed. It's been given. They've been drawn. Right? You see how this is working out? There's an explanation here that some aren't called. Lastly, I want you to consider this for me. John chapter 12. Turn the page there quickly. John chapter 12. I like to hear the pages of your Bibles turn. It's nice. You make that loud as you want to. It's just a pleasant sound. John chapter 12. And look at, down at verse 37. Okay? Now listen to this. Verse 37, this is so profound. There's so many other examples of this too, by the way. This is just in the immediate context. There's so many examples of this throughout 
the scriptures. You just cannot refute it. Verse 37, and I challenge you, I invite you to study those out. Verse 37, but although, listen to this, he had done so many signs. Who's the he there? Lord Jesus Christ, all right? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. But although Christ had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. That the word that, so that, right? So that the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? To whom has it been granted, right? To whom was it given? To whom has been drawn? Who has been drawn? Verse 39. Verse 39. Therefore, they could not believe because Isaiah said again, verse 40, he. Who's the he from Isaiah? Reference in that verse is God. Because God, we had time we'd go there. Isaiah 6, 9. God has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. If you remember the uh, same principle uh, with God and the Jewish people, Romans 9, 10, 11 where there has been a blindness. God has veiled them. God has blinded them for the time being until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. God is not drawing everyone. God is drawing some here, leaving others in their hardness of heart and blindness. And so back to John chapter six, verse 43. John chapter six, verse 43. Therefore, Jesus answered and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. I'll raise him up at the last day. If you've come to Christ in repentance and faith, it is entirely and completely and fully because of God's grace to you in Christ. Who gets all, every bit, every drop of the glory for that? God does. You have absolutely not one shred of anything that you can boast about ever. Because God gets all the glory for that. God, if you're saved, it means that God drew you to himself despite your sin, despite your lifetime of rebellion, despite your wickedness, God drew you to himself to save you, to stop your rebellion, to make you a trophy of his grace, to make you an eternal worshiper of him. So you'd better stop your grumbling if you're outside of Christ. Stop your complaining. Don't argue about his statements. Your worldly, fleshly, man-centered reasoning will not bring about the righteousness of God. James says, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Trust the Lord. If anyone ever comes to Christ, it's because the Father draws him. Is that clear? Can you see that in the text, in the context? The only ones who don't or those who have an agenda, it's just so obvious in Scripture, clearly taught throughout Scripture, you'd have to have an agenda to try to deny what the Scripture clearly says. Don't do it. The Scripture can be reconciled at so many premature levels as to create heresy. You need to follow the line of reasoning all the way out. Someone might say to, them, uh, to us in this argument, what about John 12, 32? What about that? The Bible says there, if I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. If you remember John chapter three, verse 14, when the bronze serpent was lifted in the wilderness, the Bible also said that Jesus must be lifted up. This is referring to his crucifixion, to the cross. When Jesus is lifted up, he is lifted up as the only savior for the entire world. And when the Bible says whoever comes, the Bible means whoever comes. When the Bible says whoever believes, it means whoever believes just so happens to be that if you come and if you believe it was God behind the scenes in grace drawing you to himself. But when it says all there, will, he'll lift it up and draw peoples to himself, it's all peoples. Heaven is gonna look like this. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation. It's not gonna be a bunch of white, you know, whitewashed tombs <laughs> we see often. It's diverse. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, it's all peoples. He's going to draw all kinds of peoples to himself. That's what John 12, verse 32 means. Certainly anyone that goes to heaven prays, right? They pray to Christ, they pray to God. Anyone who goes to heaven chooses to go to heaven. Everyone that goes to heaven cries out to God. They exercise their will. I want Christ, I want heaven. I'm coming to him today and I'm repenting of my sin and I'm putting my faith in him and I'm following him until the day I die. 
Every single Christian, that's the cry of their heart. But behind that, what is it that gives you that heart? What is it that changes your desire to have that? What is it that, that submits your will to him? It's God's grace in Christ. It's God's mercy to you. It's God that grants repentance. God that grants faith. The Bible teaches both truths simultaneously. Although the Bible teaches that it's God's grace that you come, the Bible also teaches equally true that you are responsible to come. You must repent. You must exercise faith and you're responsible to God if you don't. You'll go to hell when you die if you don't turn from your sin and put your trust in Christ. But that doesn't negate one iota the teaching that God is completely sovereign over all of that. You have to accept both truths simultaneously because the Bible teaches both simultaneously. You know, Spurgeon said, prove your conversion by your, or prove your election by your conversion. You don't want to know if you're elect of God? Then repent of your sins. Follow Christ, put your faith in him. I remember witnessing to a guy one time that it was fatalistic in his understanding of these things. Listen, there's not one drop of fatalism in the Bible with respect to salvation. You can't think this way. His thought was, God, I believe in your word. I believe what your word says about election, about grace. And you know what? If you want to save me, here I am. God, come and get me. I'm in my house on such and such a road. You know, if you believe that way, if that's, if that's your hard attitude, you'll never be saved. You'll die and you'll go to hell. If you think to yourself, if God's going to save, he's going to save no matter what. He's going to do it no matter what. With that hard attitude, you'll never be saved. The Lord commands repentance. The Lord commands faith. And those who ever come, those who ever believe passages are all sincere offers of the gospel meant to be obeyed. So what's, what, what are the implications of this truth? What are the implications that you don't and you can't come to Christ on your own? One of them is that it puts you in a very humbling position. I remember talking to a person one time that said they would be saved on their deathbed. They're going to live it up, live in sin all their life. They're going to wait like the thief on the cross kind of a situation. They're going to wait till they're on their deathbed. And at that last second, they're just going to pray to receive Christ. And if you have that heart attitude, you'll never be saved. It's not the, not the way it works. So what are the implications of this doctrine is that it puts you in exactly the circumstance that you should be. Completely humble, completely powerless, and completely dependent upon God alone, your creator. He didn't create you to be sovereign over your life. He's sovereign over your life. It puts you in a position that if you're going to be saved, you're going to cry out to God Almighty to save you because he's the source of salvation. And listen, don't stop crying out until you're assured that he's done it. You remember the story of the prophet with the arrows, right? He's got the arrows in his hand and the prophet said, strike the arrows on the ground. So he strikes the arrow on the ground. And he strikes three times and stopped. And the prophet rebuked him. If you would have struck 30 times, I would have given you 30 times more victory over your enemies. You keep crying out to God until you know that he saved you. You cry out to God. You ask him to reveal your heart. God, reveal my sin to me. I know that I'm blind. I don't want to be like one of these grumbling dead who don't see their sin. Lord, reveal my sin to me. Reveal how I've offended you. And then God, please reveal Christ to me as my treasure. Reveal Christ to me as precious. Save my soul. God, I want to be a worshiper of yours. You created me. I'm sick and tired of offending you. God, save my wretched soul. And you keep crying out and all of that. God gets all the glory. You've got nothing to boast about. Is there anything in us that deserves to be boasted about? Never. Not one thing. All of that supports the Bible's doctrine of assurance, puts you in the right position to examine your... Has God saved my soul? We witnessed to a man yesterday. And I just wanted to get to the point with him where he would say, you know, instead of thinking I'm saved because I said that prayer, I did this, that, or the other thing, instead of thinking that way, which is unbiblical to think, has God saved me? Has God changed my heart? Has God done a work of grace in me that I couldn't have done myself? If you think that you're, that doctrine puts you in the position of being nothing but reliant upon God, humble before God, Edward said it's the most humbling doctrine. It takes everything out of your hands and you're left with nothing in your hands before the cross of Christ. 
That's the position where if you're going to be saved, that's the position you need to be. Spiritually bankrupt before him. It supports the doctrine, the biblical doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. Because if you're going to persevere in this, it's going to be because God produces that perseverance in you. He preserves you to the end. So many good, and it's why the Bible just gloriously harmonizes together with all these, these glorious historic doctrines of the faith. Uh, that's why Arminian theology is just so damaging, so destructive, so confusing to the people who sit under it. This is God's glorious doctrines of grace, and we need to cherish those. We don't have time to get to the, to the next point. Oh, time is always short. Um, let me end this way. Um, for the Christian here, everything about your life, ordained by God, decreed by God, sovereignly and graciously and kindly and compassionately overseen by God for your good, there's no reason for complaining, Right? And not only that, but knowing that God is sovereign over all those things, you can go out in great confidence, go out in great boldness, go out in great joy as the Lord has commanded because he knows what's good for you and you trust him, right? And you believe in him. So obey the Lord, follow the Lord. Don't, not in some cavalier, half-hearted kind of way, fully from the heart. Man, get out there and share the gospel. You know, get out there and read your, study your Bible, you know? Disciple your family, labor for the Lord. This life is, you're going to blink your eyes and it's over. But if you're here today and you're not saved, you need to understand this truth. You need to leave here right now. You need to get on your knees before God and you need to cry out for God to save you. He's the only one who can. Stop rebelling against him. There's nothing in this life worth holding on to. Nothing in this life worth holding on to. Turn to Christ. You're going to blink your eyes, you young men, you young ladies. I see you kids out here. And you're going to blink your eyes and this life is going to be gone. You're going to be some old guy like me with one foot in the grave and the other one on a banana peel. <laughs> Turn to Christ now. Why would you resist? Why would you wait? Cry out to God to save your heart and don't stop crying out to God until you're sure that he's done it. And be saved. Cry out that God will enable you to see your sin, to see your offense against him then cry out to the Lord to let you see Christ for all that he is. And you, like many who've gone before you, uh, you can be a worshiper of the Lord for all eternity. Amen? Let's pray. Take a few moments and just pray silently and ask the Lord to apply this passage to your heart. Father in heaven, save now for your glory. You're the only one who can. We love you, Lord. We submit ourselves to your word. We thank you for your glorious grace in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.